Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our discussion on COVID-19, cancer, and the holidays. As we all know, cases of COVID-19 are increasing across the country and certainly in our area. And the Dis Center for Disease Control has put out new guidelines for gathering with loved ones during this holiday season. Fox Chase Cancer Center wanted to discuss these guidelines with you and include the importance of keeping those with cancer safe, as well as the emotional toll this pandemic has taken on all of us. We'll finish the evening uh, answering some questions uh, that we have received. And so I'd like to start tonight's discuss discussion with introducing our panel members. First, my name is Delinda Pendleton and I direct the patient experience at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And at this time, I'd like to also turn it over to Dr. Glenn Rawl, who's gonna introduce himself and tell you a little about his role at Fox Chase. Hello everyone. Uh, so as Delinda mentioned, my name is Glenn Rawl. I'm a faculty member here at Fox Chase. I've been a member of the scientific faculty for about 25 years. Um, my laboratory uh, right out that door behind me here studies uh, viruses. So I uh, am a virus expert. We study how viruses um, induce immune responses and cause disease. Um, and in addition to my role as a virologist and scientist, I'm also the chief academic officer here at Fox Chase. Thank you, Glenn. Dr. Boder? Yes, hi, uh, my name is Nick Boder. Uh, I am an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Medical Oncology here at Fox Chase. And I specialize in thoracic oncology. I actually was a fellow here at Fox Chase over the last three years. So I was here for the first surge of COVID cases as a fellow. Um, and, and now I'm here as an attending uh, physician as well. So certainly I, I see a lot of patients in the clinic. Um, I see a lot of patients who have very legitimate uh, concerns regarding their health, especially in respect to not only the lung cancer, but of course, uh, COVID-19 as well. So certainly I get a lot of questions um, from patients and family members on how to stay safe uh, during this whole pandemic. And I'm, I'm very happy to be able to join in this discussion tonight. Thank you, Dr. Boder. And Dr. Feinstone. Hi, my name is Paula Feinstone. I'm a clinical psychologist here at Fox Chase in the Department of Psychiatry and an assistant professor. Um, and uh, the goal of myself and our department is to support the emotional needs of patients as they're going through their cancer treatment. And especially now in the era of COVID-19 to um, also provide support as to how that impacts people on their cancer journey. So I'd like to get started with asking a few questions of the panelists tonight. I'm gonna to start with you, Dr. Rawl. Uh, can you give us an overview of the current number of cases in the Philadelphia area and what has contributed to this increase in cases that we're seeing now? Sure. So I've, I, let me start by saying that I've done a fair number of these calls and I try and balance good news amidst the bad news here. And, um, but I also am going to tell you the truth and I'm sorry to say that if I do my job correctly here, the truth is going to scare you um, because the number of cases is growing um, in a way that we didn't expect. Um, I will promise that after this bad news, I'll tell you a couple of things that you can look forward to and that you can be optimistic about. But I think we, in, in, if we're gonna be fair to our, our patients and to their families, we have to you know, sort of reckon with where we stand currently during this pandemic. So when the pandemic first began, and think back to this, right? It, it feels like it was a very, very long time ago, but it was actually only about six months ago where you know, people were going shopping at three o'clock in the morning uh, to avoid crowds. And there was great anxiety and a lot of attention to PPE and to distancing and to all those things. The number of new cases per day in Philadelphia County, it varied by day, but it was somewhere around three to 500 cases per day. 
in just Philadelphia County. So these numbers are just within the county in which we exist, but the, they're, they're actually reflected across the country. So um, the numbers are specifically Philadelphia, but there's nothing unique about Philadelphia. This is true across the country and different parts of the country have higher and maybe somewhat lower rates, but not by much. When things calm down, so think about the summertime, when you kind of worked into your routine and you know you were putting on your mask and you were going out, but you were a little bit less anxious because um, you'd figured out this, <clears throat> the way in which you were gonna be behaving in the pandemic. August, for example, was pretty good for our area. So the rates went down to somewhere on the order of 50 to 80 cases, new cases per day, again, in Philadelphia County. So the beginning of the pandemic was about 500. In the quiet phase of the summer, it was somewhere around 100. And now in Philadelphia County, it's over 1,000 new cases per day. This should be really remarkable to you because it is four or five times more than when we were all terrified at the beginning of this pandemic. And, and I think what causes this increase to the second part of Delinda's question, why is this increase occurring now? There's a lot of reasons why it is. One of them, and I'm sure that Paul is gonna talk about this, is we're all just so tired. We're, we're tired of staying home. We're tired of the restrictions. We're tired of being scared. We, we're all exhausted by this. Because on top of this, we also have children or grandchildren to take care of and lives to live and jobs to do and people to see. So our, our, the challenges of life normally are no different, but now you put onto this, this awful unwelcome layer of COVID and it just tuckers you out more than it had before. And if you're a cancer patient, add that on top of this, right? Um, I think part of the reason why we're seeing this, this very steep escalation at this phase in the pandemic is partly lack of vigilance. I think people are bored. People are now less attentive to their PPE, their masks, and to otherwise protecting themselves. Um, but it's not just due to lack of vigilance. I think new activities, right? So going back to school, we even saw a little bit of a spike right after the 4th of July. It was precisely because people were having barbecues and were getting together with friends and family. And uh, so I think the fall has many more of those activities. So back to school for kids and colleges, um, Halloween uh, probably were opportunities. And this is the whole reason why with some urgency we're talking to you about Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving strikes us even though it is a beloved holiday by most people, strikes us as being a real cause for concern. Um, of gathering people together, especially if those are people that don't normally see each other during the course of the rest of the year. Um, there's other issues I think that are accelerating this spread too. One of them is that obviously because it's colder, your people are moving inside. We know for certain that there is more of a chance of transmission of this virus from person to person if you're inside than if you're outside. But there's another thing that the cold weather does, which is that you notice that in colder weather, your skin is drier, right? So you're putting on more moisturizer and all the rest. Well, this is also true for how this virus is transmitted. So um, we refer to this as either spread by droplets or by aerosol, and they sound a little bit the same, but they're actually quite different. Droplets, sorry to be gross, but when you sneeze, you know, they're the wet particles that are kind of gross and heavy, but because they're heavy, they fall. And when they fall, that's actually generally good because they're coming out of the air and they're landing on a surface or on the floor or somewhere else. It's the whole reason why washing your hands is important. But we also know that this virus can be transmitted by aerosols. And aerosols are generated, you don't feel them. They're not, it's, it's a sort of constant mist that any of us, when we talk, are producing. And those aerosols hang in the air much, much longer. When the weather is drier, those droplets actually evaporate and turn into aerosols more. So the, there's a higher risk, not just because you're inside, but because the weather and the dry conditions allow for the virus to percolate or to stay in the air rather than falling out of the air, landing on the floor, or wherever they're gonna go, um, where they minimize or where the risk for you getting infected is minimized. So I think to, link to your question, all of these things are coming together to cause um, this increased rate um, that we're seeing the spike that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. And so you, you've, you've headed to the spread. Can you just walk us back through how 
the virus is spread again to remind us uh, in our period of being tired of this, but can you please remind us of how the virus is actually spread? Sure. So this is a classic respiratory infection. Um, it is in that sense, um, like the flu, like a common cold. Um, these are viruses that are spread um, by aerosol and by droplets. So they come out of, without trying to be gross about this, they come out of your nose, they come out of your mouth. And this is the reason why all of us are such adherents to the value of well-worn masks. Not masks under your nose, not masks under your chin, not masks when you feel like it, but masks all the time when you're in a public space. Um, because by covering up those three portals that both the virus gets out and gets in, you're putting up a barrier. Think of it almost like armor that you're protecting yourself from getting other people's aerosols and droplets if you're around someone who's infected. But likewise, if you're infected, it prevents you from being able or re minimizes, reduces the risk. It doesn't reduce it to zero, but it minimizes the risk that you would be able to spread them to someone else. So this is the maybe one of the good things about this virus is that we have tools to prevent its spread. Almost always when we see outbreaks of populations, they're in individuals um, who have not consistently worn their PPE or worn it correctly. So it sounds like consistency is the key, even though we're dealing with a period of uh, months of just having to do this day in and day out. Um, it sounds like diligence uh, is, is, is major um, to help but us. But as I'm sure my colleagues will mention, this is one of the challenges of Thanksgiving, right? Because even though it feels warm and what you want at this time of year, it is as dangerous as it can be because you're mixing people from different places, right? If somebody, if your grandchild flies in from Colorado and your kids come up from Virginia, you're mixing people from different parts of the country. They're all seated around a table, presumably inside, um, and they're eating. And so by definition, their masks are down or are off, right? And so it is, even though it is exactly what we need, it is a formula for real problems if anyone who's seated around that table is infected. Mm. And so what are the CDC guidelines then for, yeah. uh, you know, for us as we're we're approaching this major holiday for many of us, and we're finally going to be able to see our family members that we haven't seen in a long time. What are what exactly are the CDC guidelines? Yeah, they're not they're no fun, right? I mean, and they just aren't. And if you want to see them yourselves, cdc.gov, G-O-V, and they're all right there. They actually are on their splash page. That is, here's what to do with respect to Thanksgiving, and predictably the safest thing that you can do is to celebrate your Thanksgiving virtually. If, if there are people that you normally live in a house with who are part of your pod, right? If these are people that you spend all your time with, well, of course, have Thanksgiving with the folks who are part of your day-to-day your -day community. That's, of course, that's no problem. That's no different from any other time. Um, but um, if you're contemplating having family coming from outside, uh, the CDC recommends against uh, doing that. And the people that pose the highest risks are, let's say, kids coming back from college, because we already know that kids um, have a little bit of an invincibility uh, perspective, right? They tend to live a little bit more on the edge. Those are kids. You're not just bringing, um, you're not just having your kid or your grandchild come home from college but all of the kids that your child has interacted with and whatever they might have had is also coming home with him or her. And uh, so they are a potential risk here um, over the holidays. Um, traveling from places um, that have higher risk than let's say Philadelphia area, there are parts of the country that do, um, is a, um, a, a big issue here too. I, I wanna say, and then I'm gonna be quiet, I, 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 I don't like doing this, right? I don't like being this portent of scary. And I did say that there were some good things here. And, and indeed there are. Um, 
two things that are, are really worth looking forward to. Uh, one of them is that we know as physicians, and Nick may talk about this, so much more now in November than we knew back in April. We have, uh, we have ideas, we, not ideas, we have um, tools, tests, assays to check and see if a particular COVID positive patient is heading down a dangerous course. And now we have drugs that we know work and also drugs um, that we know don't work. Um, hydrochloroquine does not work. Things like remdesivir probably works. Um, other, other drugs that inhibit your uh, hyperaggressive immune response seem to work. So now we have tools that we didn't have back in April, and that's good. Um, and that has re resulted in a substantial decrease in the death rate from this infection. So that's all very good. But let's also bear in mind that this is not a nice virus to get under normal circumstances. It can have long lasting effects on certain patients, um, and the consequences for it, um, even if you survive this infection, which you are likely to, uh, to do, still can be fairly substantial. So it is, it is not something to discount or to say, well, this is, let's just go ahead and get this infection and get it over with. That would be, um, I think, foolish and cavalier. So good that we have a lot of uh, new medicines and new knowledge. And the other thing is, and you read about them each, each morning, we have vaccines that were right on the precipice of being delivered. These are safe, these are effective. You should absolutely consider getting these a vaccine when they're delivered or when they're available, but they're not gonna be here in time for Thanksgiving. And so until that period of time where you get that shot in the arm um, and presumably then are, are afforded some protection from this infection, vigilance is gonna be the key. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rawl, for that. Uh... Uh, so good news and bad news, but we think it's very important that our, our patients are aware of what's going on. Um, and so I'd like to switch at this time to ask uh, Dr. Boder to speak. We, we've heard from Dr. Uh, Rawl about the CDC recommendations. Um, are, they, are these recommendations different for our cancer patients? And if so, what, what should we learn about those recommendations? Thank you. No, that, that, that's a very good question. And um, I, I want to say quite simply that the, the recommendations really do not vary significantly uh, for cancer patients. It's really not much different from the kind of the general recommendations uh, that we give to everybody. I mean, these are recommendations that are, are truly universal and applies to all of us. And to kind of echo many of the things that Dr. Raw has already uh, touched on, I mean, I certainly cannot emphasize mask wearing enough, uh, not only in public, but also when uh, patients are here at Fox Chase, certainly all the providers are wearing masks. We ask our patients to wear masks um, and we try our best to maintain uh, social distancing even within the clinic room itself. I mean, certainly the physical exam is a, is a key component of, of every uh, clinic visit. So certainly at times we might have to get a little bit closer, but otherwise we, really try to embrace a lot of these same sort of uh, kind of standard precautions like mask wearing. Um, in addition to that, um, I do also want to emphasize that uh, mask wearing not only you know, protects the individuals around us, like I think the large majority of us are aware of by now, but there's also growing evidence that indicates that mask wearing actually helps protect the individual wearing the mask as well. Um, otherwise, I mean, patients certainly when they're out in public, should try to maintain a six feet distance from other people when they're out, try to avoid crowded areas. Washing your hands frequently, of course, is a, is a key precaution. As providers, we're washing our hands constantly before we see our patients. And I think that's something that's important for the patients to embrace themselves. Uh, trying to avoid touching your mouth or eyes or nose without washing your hands first. And especially during the holidays and everything else, uh, really trying to avoid non-essential travel and trying your best to stay home and um, avoiding contact with individuals out of your, uh, outside of your quote unquote pod or outside of your immediate family. Um, I know how incredibly tough that is, especially when you're you know, facing a diagnosis like cancer, you're getting active treatment. Um, that support group, your family, your friends, your loved ones are absolutely essential to get you through um, the treatment and the diagnosis. So I know how hard it can potentially be. Um, but unfortunately, even with the holidays and everything approaching, it is absolutely essential uh, that we try to maintain that social distance, 
um, trying to do things via Zoom or via the internet, like Dr. Uh, Rawl had mentioned in regards to Thanksgiving dinner and everything else, I think is a very uh, important component uh, to keeping patients safe this season. And when it comes to doctor's appointments, I mean, here at Fox Chase, um, many of these appointments became uh, via telehealth. We did that very early on in the spring uh, to really decrease the amount of patient contact um, that they had to experience when, when going out, uh, you know, that comes with going out in public. And um, that's something we've continued to do through the summer. And as uh, uh, cases are starting to surge again in this area, it's certainly telemedicine, those sort of things are something that's definitely here to stay and something we're going to see more of. And I think it's a very important component of, of keeping patients safe. Are these precautions appropriate for the caregivers as well? Yes, um, that's, that's a good question as well. So first, yes, it, it very much applies to the caregivers as well. As well. Uh, first, not only because the caregivers themselves can get seriously ill. I mean, frequently, you know, we have patients who it's their wife or a husband who uh, the caregivers themselves may have comorbidities or, or other things that puts them at, at a greater risk for having a serious case. So uh, yes, the caregivers need to be safe, not only for their own health and protection, uh, but in addition to that, these caregivers can also give the virus uh, to the very same patients that they're taking care of who may be at even greater risk uh, for, for potential serious complications. Taking these personal precautions like social distancing and mask wearing like that, like we've been talking about, um, really helps protect uh, the patient that, that you're caring for. And ultimately, I mean, we're all in this together. And uh, for us to emerge on the other side of this really requires us to all embrace and adopt these very important precautions. Great. Are our cancer patients uh, more at risk for uh, complications of COVID uh, should they be exposed? Yes, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I think what we've learned uh, thus far throughout the pandemic that uh, certain comorbidities, and this includes cancer, um, does potentially increase the risk of having more serious complications if one were to be infected with COVID. Um, for instance, certain cancers like hematological or, or bone marrow type cancers really directly affects uh, a patient's immune system and may affect their ability to combat the virus. Um, in addition to, unfortunately, a lot of the therapies we use to, to treat cancer like chemotherapy and radiation and other forms of therapy can weaken the immune system of the patients that we're treating, which ultimately could lead to more serious complications if the patient were to get uh, COVID-19 during this time. And in addition, many of the patients with cancer that we see have other comorbidities that increases their risk for serious issues. For instance, um, as a lung cancer doctor, I, I see a lot of patients with lung cancer and many of my patients have other underlying lung issues like COPD, uh, which can greatly increase uh, their risk uh, for complications if they were to unfortunately contract uh, COVID-19. Great, that, that helps. And, and I know that uh, our goal in sharing this information is certainly not to place our patients at higher levels of fear, um, but we, we believe that information is, is crucial. Information is very important. And so I'm hoping that those of you who are hearing this information um, don't take this as a reason to stop treatment or put off treatment or procedures, um, but to just make sure that you're aware that these risks do exist. So thank you, Dr. Rawl and uh, Dr. Boder for those points of Im important information. Dr. Feinstone, uh, certainly in your area of expertise, um, you see our patients uh, for different reasons. And, um, and we know that um, this particular pandemic uh, also affects everyone, not just our patients, but how has this COVID-19 pandemic actually affected our mental health, not just patients, but, but everyone's mental health overall? Well, um, it certainly has across a number of, of spectrums. One of the 
one of the biggest changes that I've noticed that all of us struggle with is the uncertainty. Uh, cancer patients themselves already have anxiety about um, being at greater risk for complications. Um, and then to add the additional uncertainty about COVID. Uh, yes, testing has gotten better. Uh, yes, we understand more about how to treat the disease, but there still is, I think, a lot of anxiety about uh, what situations are safe and what are risks that patients um, and family members um, need to take sometimes, like having to do their marketing or like wanting to have contact with family members and also the worry that patients might have about their caregivers falling ill. Um, I feel especially, especially um, bad for all of us because the two big coping skills that we have for getting through difficult times have been taken from us right now. And that is being able to socially interact with people and being able to get out of the home to engage in recreational activities, going to the movies, retail therapy, um, going to the gym, all of those things have been kind of put on hold at the present moment. Um, and then I certainly have interacted with patients and, and other family members who are feeling such a sense of loss. They feel a sense of loss of control cancer already gives to them, um, as well as a sense of loss of control um, over COVID, not knowing what information to trust because they're, the media can sometimes present very conflicting information. People who are experiencing um, just even personal, personal losses, whether their loved one passed away from COVID-19 or passed away from another condition during this time and not being able to, to grieve as well. It's been, it's been challenging. It's really been challenging for, for the people that I interact with. I know Paula also that, um, you know, there's with this uh, pandemic and with our desire to protect our patients and our, and our workers as much as possible, you know, there's also these restrictions that we've placed, not just at Fox Chase, but most institutions of healthcare. Um, and so the, the, the support system that is usually there um, for our patients has also been taken away. Have you, have you found that that has also added to the level of anxiety for our patients? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, our department um, and the social work department that also provides support to patients at Fox Chase, have, we've all been very, very, very busy. Um, to, the, to the positive, uh, with the advent of telehealth, it's enabled us to reach out to patients who sometimes would feel too ill to come to the hospital for face-to-face -face therapy appointments or patients who live at a distance where transportation is sometimes a challenge. Um, but certainly there has been a great deal, of, great deal of need. And so we're encouraging patients to participate in telehealth. And we're also encouraging them to use technology to reach out to friends and family, whether it's phone calls, whether it's video chats, whether it's emails and texting to provide that that social support. Um, early on in the pandemic, I forgot who the commentator was, but somebody who framed it as what we need to focus on is physical distancing for our safety, but the social aspects need to stay in place because that's what helps us cope. But using other approaches to get those social needs met that will enable us to stay safe. I, I, I echo that and that's so important. And so we certainly have to have become more creative, if you will. In addition to telehealth, we've also made available to our patients who may not have brought their phones with them or other uh, devices. Uh, we make um, iPads and phones available to our patients who are in-house or 
even on the campus uh, to connect in a three way um, with their loved ones who cannot come in. Um, I'm sure Dr. Boder, you have done the three way conversations with patients when they come into the clinics as well. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, and, and that's been one of the challenging things, um, not having the, the patient's uh, caregiver or loved one there in the room with you uh, when you're talking to them about their diagnosis or what the treatments are involved and everything else. But you're right, we've kind of found a way to work around that the best we could. And, and that really involves uh, either calling them or every, or sometimes the patient might have an iPad and we can actually um, have them join via the internet, via Zoom. So we've, we've definitely found creative ways to still have kind of that family support system, the other caregivers there uh, in the room kind of remotely as we have uh, these very serious discussions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Feinstone, I also would like to ask you another question. We heard uh, Dr. Rawl mention this uh, COVID fatigue term um, earlier. Yeah. And, and so perhaps you can comment on yeah. what, what exactly that term means and how does it contribute to the, uh, this holiday season that we're approaching? Well, um, in general, for us as human beings, behavior change is very, is very difficult. And I certainly have had patients say that they are tired of the restrictions. They're feeling a great deal of frustration. Um, sometimes that frustration kind of pushes people to engage in more risky behaviors, which of course is concerning um, from their, you know, in, in regard to their health. Um, and then sometimes not getting full accurate information about what the risks are. So um, I'm thinking really that it's important for, for patients to express their concerns to their care team. I have those discussions um, in some situations that safety becomes very important. Here at, at Fox Chase, when patients are at end of life, we've really encouraged that contact because that is important as well. And then a couple of other ideas I had about, about navigating the uh, COVID fatigue is to encourage patients to have some sort of structure in their life, to have a routine, to try to even if they don't feel well, to try to do something productive every day, whether it's to read a chapter in a book or clean out the junk drawer um, or go for a walk to the mailbox to allow for a little bit of time outside of the house, but to be able to do it safely. Again, whether it's taking a walk in their, in their neighborhood with a mask and by themselves or with a family member, going for a ride in the car and just being able to see something different and not feel so so trapped and to, to also maintain those connections through phone calls, through video chat, through, through email. Again, I know with the upcoming uh, holiday season, um, this is gonna be a major challenge. Um, um, and do you feel that it's, I guess I should ask, how do you feel that's gonna affect uh, people on the, um, mental side of things uh, since people will not be able to um, connect physically. Um, how do you think that are, that's going to affect people? Um, I think for some families, it's going to be very challenging because there's such tradition around uh, holiday celebrations this time of year, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's. Um, and uh, you, we, we all culturally feel those are family times, gathering times. Um, but on the other hand, I think so many of us are anxious about what are the, what are the risks. So I, again, I encourage patients to discuss their concerns with their, with their teams and uh, what is safe. And then to also feel comfortable to assert themselves with, with family members. Some family members may feel more comfortable taking risks and gathering, and it's perfectly okay for patients to say, you know, I have to do what is right for me and what's safe for me and what my, my medical team is recommending. 
and be able to maintain that. Um, the other thing that really connects us all is to share the feelings. Um, to share the feelings that we're, we're sad that we can't meet in the usual way or we can't pursue those traditions this year. But let's also be creative and see if there's other ways that we can that we can connect. I really appreciate that comment about um, making sure that we're, uh, patients are sharing with their family members how important this is for the, for their safety, um, and to feel to feel empowered to do that. Um, um, it's it's hard to. Uh, go against the tradition, if you will. Uh, that's that's very challenging, even outside of COVID. Um, the minute we make try to make a change with family or, or traditions, um, we sometimes find ourselves um, uh, in the doghouse with our family members. But I, I think your point is well taken that this is too important. Um, and, and our family members hopefully um, will get the message. So empowering our patients to stand up for what's important for them and their safety uh, has to be a message that we, we can't shy away from. Yeah, we can't control the decisions that other people make, mm -hmm. but we can control the decisions that we make on our behalf as, as patients, as caregivers, as staff. Mm -hmm. Um, and to, I appreciate my colleagues here really emphasizing the importance of maintaining safety at this time. The other thing, just to make a quick little addition and to underscore this point is that, you know, all of us here at the Cancer Center think about this all the time, but it could be that family members are just, you know, some, there, there are people who have chosen to just kind of not pay attention to the the grisly numbers they may be vaguely aware that there's a you know another wave coming but they don't know all of the details that we do um feel free to share this video with them right if you forget some of the details or you can you know sort of say just watch this and then see if you understand why i might be concerned about sharing my thanksgiving with with other folks we want to be part of your team, not just to educate you, but also to, um, to help you be clear with your colleagues and with your friends and your family, how you feel. That's an excellent point. So for, for patients who are receiving this message um, and, and, but still want to socially connect with their loved ones, uh, we've talked about, uh, uh, you know, Zoom and, and uh, uh, talking about connecting virtually, what are some other good ways to celebrate these holidays that are coming up while still following the CDC guidelines? Well, I've actually heard some pretty creative ideas. Um, I've heard about families who are going to be in their homes, but they're all going to be watching the same movie together. And then perhaps connecting at the same time through video chat or through texting and giving their giving their opinions. Um, I also have heard about families who will play games that way. Um, games that can be can be like a trivial pursuit or or maybe like Pictionary where where there's a um, there's an interactive component and you don't necessarily need specific game pieces, but you can still interact in in that way. Um, in some places, uh, I've heard of families making plans to meet outdoors briefly. Um, there was one, uh, one, uh, township up, uh, in New England, they do pie in the driveway for Thanksgiving. So it's outdoors. It's just dessert. You grab your piece of pie and because it's so cold, you don't linger but you get to connect briefly outside and then everyone goes back to their own home. Um, I've also heard about family members who are making care baskets for people who are stuck inside. So you might still be making that casserole, uh, sweet potato casserole for 12, but now you portion it out into six portions and drop it off with your various family members and then eat together on Zoom. So 
being able to share some of the tradition, but also maintain that, maintain that safety. Very creative, very creative. I've gotten some great ideas from you. <laughs> very good. Um, given all that we've heard, um, we still, COVID is still not going away. Um, how can we um, address the fact that we still um, are dealing with this virus that's not going away tomorrow? And how can our patients and caregivers reach out for um, additional mental health resources uh, during this, this critical time that again, is not going away tomorrow? Sure. Well, I do encourage patients to bring up their concerns again with their oncology team. And I, again, commend my college, colleagues they're very good at then directing patients to our service and to social work service. Patients can also directly call our department at 215-214-3940. They can call social work for support at 215-728-2668. And the other resource I'd like to put out there is the uh, Resource and Education Center um, at 215-214. 2141618 they offer a peer to peer network a peer to peer network for caregivers and a lot of information about other community resources virtual support groups and other ways for patients caregivers family members to get that emotional support at these challenging times Thank you, Dr. Feinstone. And certainly uh, if those numbers went by too quickly, you can always go to our website where um, you can uh, put in the search engine um, those uh, um, psych, psych services, social work services, our uh, resource and education center, um, and you'll be able to get that information from our website as well. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I want to open it up to the rest of the panelists to say, is there anything else you'd like to share in closing uh, before we close out tonight? I'll start with Dr. Rawl and then we'll go around again. So we are beginning to see the end of this pandemic and that is true. The fact that these vaccines are on the horizon are a signal that we are going to have tools not just to control the disease if you get COVID, but to prevent you from getting COVID in the first place. Please do consider very, very strongly getting a vaccine when they become available. And those vaccines we expect, I don't know this for a fact, but these vaccines should be available before the end of the year, and if not, then soon after the new year. And that's not far away. So even if you feel like your tank is pretty close to out of gas, hang in there a little bit longer because there is good news coming. And this thing, once we all have gotten, or once a substantial number of us have taken the vaccine, um, it's gonna give us liberty to be able to go back and have those holidays that we very, very much want to have. So hang in there a little bit longer. Good news is coming. Thank you, Dr. Rawl. Dr. Voter, any final comments? Yeah, I just want to, I certainly want to echo what Dr. Rawl just said. Those are all very important key things that uh, we all need to keep in mind and patients need to keep in mind. And I also want to emphasize that uh, as providers here at Fox Chase, as, as the kind of the quarterbacks of, of, your, of your care team and, as, and your cancer treatment team, please know that we're here for you um, for all range of things, whether it's medical or, or mental health related. Um, certainly, if you're having difficulties coping or you want to speak with some of our excellent mental health providers or some of our amazing social workers, you see us as medical oncologists probably more than anyone else here at the center. So please, please let us know if you need help. We're happy to refer you to our excellent professionals who deal with those issues. Um, and in addition to that, please also, uh, Tell us if you're, if you're not necessarily comfortable coming in. Let's say you're coming in for a follow-up CT scan. 
that doesn't necessarily have to be reviewed in person if you're comfortable doing it over the phone, we can certainly make these type of accommodations. We're happy to do things via telemedicine and everything else to make sure that uh, you remain safe um, during the season. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boder. And Dr. Feinstone, any final comments? Yes, I want people to know that uh, living with a cancer diagnosis, going through cancer treatment as a patient, as a caregiver, as a family member is challenging enough. And then to add the stress of COVID-19 on top of that, um, just it just adds to the challenge. I want to reassure people that what they're feeling, the anxiety, the stress is so common, so normal, so understandable at this point. And again, to, to feel comfortable to reach out to the team here um, at all levels, because we're, we're here for you. We're here to help you get through these challenging times. Thank you. Well, thank you all, Dr. Glenn Rawl, Dr. Boder, Dr. Feinstone for taking the time to talk to us about these very, very important topics regarding COVID-19, regarding cancer care and the upcoming holidays. We hope that everyone learned a lot during this chat. And if you have any additional questions for our panelists, please leave a comment. Um, and again, check out our, our website uh, where we also have a lot of important information to share. Thanks everyone. Have a great night and stay safe. <laughs>